Well, hi everybody, Father Alex here. Welcome to another episode of the Godcast. I'm the uh, host of the Godcast. I'm also the vicar of St Matthew's Church, and I'm also the author of Our Daily Bread from Argos to the Altar: A Priest Story, which is out now and is available at all good bookshops and online. My guest on the Godcast today is James Essis. Now, James is um, he is a commentator. He's a writer. He's an advocate uh, who speaks out about the impact of the ideology on society and is also the co-founder of Thoughtful Therapist. He's got a very interesting story. We're going to learn more about that now. So I do hope you enjoy this uh, this podcast with James Ennis. And uh, if you do, please check out others. There's lots of interviews, lots of um, people to choose from and do perhaps consider subscribing to the podcast. But for now, enjoy this interview. Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast this week is James Essis. Uh, James, welcome to the Godcast. How are you? Thanks, Alex. Very good. Thanks for having me on. So um, I know your story is quite widely known, but there will be people who are not familiar with it. So if we could start, James, by by giving some context to us. You, you originally uh, were a lawyer. Just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I started off, I, I qualified and was practicing as a criminal criminal defense barrister. Um, and then I kind of moved into prosecution, prosecution policy. So I've kind of always had a background in crime and criminal justice. Um, but then I began to to volunteer as a counselor at, at Childline, which is part of the NSPCC. And, you know, I found the kind of counseling younger people so fulfilling that I thought, actually, that's what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. And so that's when I decided to kind of transition um, out of law and into psychotherapy. And I started on a master's degree in psychotherapy and and, and then it all kicked off. Were there things in, in the job as, a, you know, working in the justice system that were was leading you to a vocation change? You know, were there injustices that you were seeing or what, what was it that, that really prompted the move? Well, certainly, I didn't feel that I was able to make as much of a tangible difference as I had kind of first uh, hoped. Um, you know, I realised that actually I was just a you know a small cog in a very very big wheel. Whereas, again, with the psychotherapy and the counselling, actually being able to work one to one with somebody, hopefully see the progress over a period of time, etc. It, it it just felt more personally fulfilling. And when you began this work with you know with with Childline. Was there a theme to the to the phone calls that were that were coming in? Just just share a bit about that, if you could, James. Mm. Um, I mean, ch children and young people would come through for all manner of reasons, and I, I could go from a contact discussing uh, kind of friendship falling out or kind of bullying in school to uh, domestic abuse in the home to uh, suicidal ideation and self harm. Um, quite a broad spectrum in terms of safeguarding and risk, but but kind of all manner of, of presentations. And alongside this, I guess at university you're 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 studying and learning about all these different processes. Yes. But then the, this issue about gender dysphoria comes along. First of all, James, can I can I just ask you to explain to people uh, what gender dysphoria is? I know, you know, to a lot of people it's like, well, surely you know, but it's a yeah. word that's it's a phrase that's kind of quite new, isn't it, in society? It is, um, and some are trying to kind of water it down, um, but essentially it's it's a mental health condition. Um, it's listed under the Diagnostic St Statistical Manual, which is essentially the kind of uh, manual of mental health conditions and disorders that is used by psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists. It's what we use in the United Kingdom. Um, and it, you know, it, gender dysphoria, in essence, kind of describes uh, a kind of very um, debilitating uh, sensation, feeling that there's a kind of mismatch between your sex and you, you, the concept of how you, know, how you feel inside. Um, you know, it you have to be diagnosed with it to to transition medically or legally in this country, um, and that's crucial. Um, and that's kind of the starting point for me um, in terms of how you deal with somebody who's feeling this mismatch, who's who's not feeling at ease in their body. And what was what was 
what was being taught to you at the university about this subject? Um, the, I mean, the, the very, very little, um, and psychotherapy training is, is, is lacking in a lot of ways generally, um, in terms of the contact hours, in terms of how it's assessed, but essentially I was being taught that, um, everyone's got a you know unique gender identity and you know we shouldn't be pathologizing this um and you know essentially if you push back against that this uh, this could be a transphobia um you know which was concerning to me because it's a mental health condition and a psychotherapist's we're going to have clients coming through with these presentations and so it's important for us to be able to at least have a dialogue amongst each other as to what we believe is in the best interests of these clients and kind of try and work collaboratively of course people will have different opinions that's fine um you know it can be a broad church but in terms of what ended up happening to me and what i've seen happen to other professionals and colleagues they're just shutting down the conversation altogether hmm. well we'll come on to that in a minute and, yeah. and in terms of the charity work actually working with i think you said it was childline james yeah was there, was there advice given to you how you should or training or coaching how you should respond to these phone calls as and when they came in um at, at, at the beginning no but then i started to notice things kind of changing around me I, I would come in for my shift and i would see that there were posters from stonewall plastered on the wall right where i was looking when i'm literally on the phone to these children saying some people are trans get over it and i started to think okay what are they trying to suggest here to counselors i know that the people weren't really comfortable in kind of bringing up these kind of topics of conversation we had kind of diversity inclusion training um as part of that role again pushing a narrative around gender identity um childline's website because often we would refer children onto parts of childline's website there's a page on gender identity it didn't tell children that this is a mental health condition and that most children will essentially grow out of it and settle into their bodies it was more of a roadmap towards different ways they might want to transition so i was becoming increasingly concerned with the kind of narrative that the nspcc and childline were pushing and how would how would that present itself, James, in in the context of a telephone call? Was it was it was it mainly boys or girls? Was it uh, teenagers particularly, or was it was it mm. children younger than that? Could you say a little bit about that? Um, in in terms of the contacts I had on this topic, um, majority were girls. Majority were young girls. Um, I think the youngest I would have spoken to who said they felt they were trapped in the wrong body was around the age of eight or nine years old. So kind of pre-pubescent. Um, but over, I mean, I was there for about five, six years and year on year, I was noticing an increase in the number of children coming through with this presentation. And why do you think that was? Was it a trend or in your mind or? It's, well, uh, I believe that there's a number of contributing factors. I think there's an element of contagion in, in relation to this as a kind of mental health presentation. Um, I believe it's partly down to what is being taught in schools um, and what children are kind of picking up on as well. Uh, and outside of school, from the media as it then was, uh, from social media, um, from third sector organizations, um, and, and even th through kind of corporations um, kind of pushing a particular narrative. So I think children are absorbing this, as we know children do. And um, and also it kind of makes sense because, I mean, most of us are unhappy with parts of our body or parts of ourselves. I think that's kind of part of the human condition in many ways, and particularly children, particularly children going through puberty and all those changes going on. Um, and now there's kind of a silver bullet being promised essentially, which is, well, if you don't like a part of your body, you can just get rid of it now. Um, and I think that could be quite appealing to a child who's feeling very um, insecure in themselves. Was it difficult to, I mean, I would use the, the word pastor, you might use the word counsel or, or whatever, yeah. but was it difficult to advise and help those individuals? But, you know, when you were suggesting something or proposing something, was there much resistance or were they empathetic to what you were saying 
Well, the thing is that, you know, the model used at, at uh, Childline and the model that I use generally um, and w when I was kind of practicing in psychotherapy is around exploration. You know, I've never viewed it as my role because and it isn't the role of a therapist to tell clients what to do, to try and push them in a direction. Um, I, I would simply explore um, which was contrary to, and that's that's what you're meant to do and that's contrary to what some of my colleagues would do which is not is the opposite of exploration so I would read case notes from other counsellors who had spoken to children who come in a child says they're trans and the counsellor would essentially affirm it which means nodding along with this if the child said they wanted to go and take puberty blockers the counsellor would kind of nod along with that of so keep affirming them down that path uh, that's to me not ethical counselling. That's not exploration. So if a child came through to me and said they thought they were trapped in the wrong body, I would ask open-ended questions about how long they felt like this, what else has been going on in their life, what other parts of themselves they don't like, what options they think they've got generally. I would often do kind of thought experiments. You know, I would say, okay, let's imagine years down the line, five years from now, you've taken the puberty blockers, the cross-sex hormones, maybe you've even had surgery. Are you happy? And, and more often than not, and, you know, that's not a leading question. That's just exploration. More often than not, they'd come back and say, well, no, because there's still X, Y, Z I, I dislike about myself. And, and slowly, you, you know, they, they'd come to realize that actually this wasn't maybe the solution that they thought it was. And that maybe this was symptomatic of kind of wider disease in themselves. And, and what prompted you to go uh, public, James? You know, what, what was the things that kind of getting you so frustrated or 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 determined to to speak out about this what what was it uh the well the, the catalyst for kind of really going public with it was when the government announced at the time this ban on conversion therapy um because i was already experiencing kind of a shutdown of conversation and dialogue within the therapeutic profession. And there was a real concern that this legislation would make things even worse and might almost force therapists um, for fear of criminalization into affirming clients rather than exploring. So <clears throat> that's that was kind of the the catalyst that really kind of made me put myself out there. But I had been I'd been increasingly concerned over a period of a few years and was just trying to kind of get my head straight in terms of where I sat with this and what I thought was kind of the best way to address it. And then the university picked up on the fact that you'd gone public. Is that what happened? Can you just talk us through that part of the story, James? Yeah, so I <clears throat> I, I drew up a petition to the government asking them to safeguard explorative therapy as part of any legislation. Um, and the petition did quite well, and it got 10,000 signatures and a response from the government, and I did some associated publicity around that, started putting some things out on social media. Uh, and, yeah, uh, one day out of the blue in May 2021, I was told that there had been some complaints made about me. Um, I was asked to come in for an informal chat to discuss it. They didn't share with me the nature of the complaints. They just said it had been in relation to kind of the trans things that I've been talking about. I agreed to come in for the chat, but the chat never happened because the very next day I received another email telling me that actually uh, I was being summarily expelled from the course because I had supposedly brought the profession into disrepute. Um, and that was it. I, over, over a single email, I was effectively excommunicated. So what did you do then? Uh, I cried. Um, I, I mean, did, I, I felt completely lost. Did, did you know that, uh, saying what you'd said would be controversial? Did, did you think it was quite reasonable and well thought rationale behind the argument? Were you surprised that the university wasn't encouraging that? Uh, yes, because it's expressly written into their policies. Um, there's, there's a part of their policy which makes a point of saying that students and tutors might disagree with things, but what's important is that you're able to have open, respectful dialogue about matters. So it seemed compl I, so I, 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 I was shocked then, and I still remain shocked now as to how they thought that this was a reasonable measure to take against a, a master's student on, in the third year. Um, I just you know, of all the vocations for this kind of shutdown of dialogue to take place in, I mean, the, the, the fundamental basis of psychotherapy is active listening. 
I mean, it's it's kind of crazy to me. Um, and also, not one jot of consideration given to the the impact that the way they uh, dealt with this might have on on my own well being. And any kind of <clears throat> pastoral care seemed to go completely out the window. Did you um, did do you think they thought you would go away quietly? Were they, you know, did were they? Uh, what was the response when you kind of said, "Well, I'll take you to court." Well, I've never actually had a conversation with anyone there since right. this happened. <clears throat> Well, actually, that's a lie. I have had students and choosers uh, anonymously contacting me saying that they also share my concerns, but are too afraid to speak out, which is interesting. But in terms of the kind of the upper echelons of the institution, I've not had a conversation with anyone. They seem to want to kind of fight this all the way. Um, did they think I would go away quietly? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think they did much thinking at all, to be honest. Um, but I, But I think... I, I believe that this institution, as many others, have kind of bought this ideology, hook, line and sinker, kind of fervently believe it. And anything that challenges the narrative they believe in, they just want to shut down. And so, I, you know, I, the, my, my, the case I'm bringing in is on discrimination against my beliefs. And, and that's ex that's precisely why I believe they did what they did. Um, and had I been publicly speaking about some other issue, uh, I don't know, anti-Semitism in society or... or uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, even the even more polarized things like what's going on in Ukraine or what's going on in, in the Middle East at the moment, I, I would still be, well, I would have qualified from that course. I wouldn't have been kicked out. It was because of this topic and because of my beliefs. And I can hear I can hear the audience wondering, well, where is he in the legal process? Where, where are you, James, in that legal process? Um, well, I also took litigation against the one of the kind of main governing bodies of therapists. They're called the UK Council for Psychotherapy. Um, I recently reached a settlement with them and they put out um, what I think is a very important kind of ground, groundbreaking statement, which basically says that the beliefs that I held are kind of valid professional beliefs within the therapeutic profession um, and are protected under law. Um, so that was quite important. So I've kind of de dealt with them. Um, but in terms of getting to try with the institution, it's it's a very, very slow process. Um, and essentially, we're waiting for trial dates. And I think hopefully by the end of April, we'll have we'll have trial dates listed. I mean, it, it we might not get on to trial until 2025, which will have been about three and a half years after I was expelled, which is, again, kind of crazy. But that's, you know, that's the justice system and I have to work within it. What have, what have been the, the consequences? I mean... Um, the pluses, maybe in the minuses, James, of, of that, <clears throat> that happening for you. I mean, you've you know a, you know, a, a, I suppose as one door closes, another one opens. And whilst you've not been able to continue the course, you you now speak as we are on a, a public platform. Mm. What do you what would you say about that? Uh, I've 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 met some 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 very decent inspirational people um, through this. Um, which I'm grateful for. Um, I've seen some of the best of human beings, including in the support that I've received and even the kind of financial backing, because I wouldn't have been able to bring my case without crowdfunding. So I've seen a huge amount of kind of empathy and generosity. Um, I've also seen the worst of people. I mean, the type of abuse, I guess, online, <clears throat> death wishes, forever being called transphobe, uh, bigot, conversion therapist um people trying to kind of find personal details trying to find my home address so they can post it online trying to hack into various accounts i've got um essentially trying to kind of screw up my life as as much as possible um and i think it you know now people google my name they see what i'm associated with and if they don't agree with my beliefs that gives them uh, a reason and an opportunity to essentially sh uh, close the door on certain opportunities so I think it certainly made my life a lot more complicated than it otherwise might have been um, but for me I can sleep soundly at night because I feel that I've been true to myself and my principles and so for me that will always be the most important thing even if I've kind of personally suffered for it yeah, and, and can we just unpack that a bit about transphobia, James? I mean, you I would guess you would say you're not transphobic. You're just a, a, you're just calling for better care and 
consideration of how people are educated. Is that fair? I mean, I've I've got a a couple of people I know who who are trans, uh, older people, um, you know, who speak very eloquently about their own story and their own journey. But from a different generation, you know, these are people mm. who went through the process probably in the seventies or eighties. So let's be clear: are you saying you're not trans, you're not transphobic. Depends what the definition of transphobic is, and and the, the 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 modern definition seems to be anyone who speaks out against any form of gender ideology, questions men entering women's spaces, question children being put on puberty blockers. Hmm. If that is the modern definition of transphobia, and I think it might be in a lot of circles, then yes, I am transphobic. But if it's based around having a hatred or a fear of or a disdain for or trying to discriminate against people because of how they feel inside, then no, I'm not. I'm a concerned citizen, particularly concerned about what we're doing to our children. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've chatted, uh, since I knew you were coming on the Godcast, James, I've chatted with uh, uh, other clergy about this. I mean, it's, it's a matter of morality, ethics, whichever way you want to frame it. And and in the church, the, you know, we've had, uh, there's a raging row about, the term conversion therapy, you know, there's there's the way it's used in the way to kind of um, used against people of uh, who may be gay of you know turning away from something in terms of a spiritual uh, matter, mm. you know. But it, but your your context is different, is it? Well, I've I've worked with a, a number of Christian organisations on on including on the conversion therapy ban because there's kind of the the, the similar con concerns there, um, and I'm not I'm not coming at it myself from a, a perspective of religion, but I can see the arguments um, coming from a lot of these Christian organisations because um, there's a real risk that this legislation will just, you know effectively criminalise conversations, even kind of pastoral conversations. Um, and I can't, I can't get my head around that because I, I can't understand how we can have a society in which a child can consent to irreversible puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, that they can consent to that, but they cannot consent to a conversation with a priest or with a therapist. I, I, I it doesn't make sense to me. Do you differentiate between trans and LGB? yeah completely and again this legislation this prospective legislation conflates the two of those things because as i said i i don't recognize the concept of gender identity and because because you need to be diagnosed with a mental health condition in order to transition in this country then I, i'm i'm not even going to use the term gender identity i'm going to use the term gender dysphoria and so to conflate that with one's sexuality i i, I don't think is acceptable and i've seen a lot of forced teaming going on um, you know, I see these placards being uh, held up at pride marches, etc. You know, no LGB without the T. Well, you know, who the hell are you to make that comment? I know a lot of LGB people who completely reject that notion. Um, so I, I, I think the, the, the development of that acronym has been one of the biggest issues because now it's what everyone uses and it rolls off the tongue so easily. You know, I, I wrote a piece about this recently. I said, you know, if you were in a, in a bar looking at a, a a spirits or a drinks list and you see g and asterisk you're gonna add in the t because it's so familiar to you and it's the same thing here and people use it without even thinking about the kind of consequences of it i spoke to helen joyce uh james uh, on similar subjects mm -hmm. and, and she was very critical of stonewall because she uh, effectively said you know that we wouldn't have these issues if it wasn't for groups like stonewall because they you know they almost won the uh, the lesbian and gay argument and this yeah. is a uh, is a further way to kind of uh, uh, extenuate the these issues do, do you agree with that i think they've got a lot to answer for i mean i'm not going to lay the blame you know, solely at their door, but yeah, they've got a lot to answer for. And again, it was a very, from them, I've, I've done research into it, it was a very calculated um, strategic move because sex, sex-based rights, kind of uh, same-sex attraction, had, uh, well, society had essentially been transformed was far better than it was. We saw kind of parity and equality across the law and Stonewall began to lose its relevance 
Um, and people were rightly asking, well, do, you know, what is the purpose of Stonewall? Do, do they really need to continue uh, anymore? Have they served their purpose? Um, and then all of a sudden, there's a new leader in Stonewall and they've got a brand new policy, which is for the first time ever to become trans inclusive. There was a point in time in which they made a specific uh, statement saying that they weren't going to be trans inclusive because they felt that those aims were actually counter to trying to you know put forward um, the best possible campaigning for LGB people. But all of a sudden overnight, they've got a new policy, a new agenda, new long term strategy. Uh, and that's it. They've kind of been able to uh, turn their hand to something else and keep making money as a result and, and stay relevant. So I think um, it was it was wholly strategic on their part. Um, and I think that did kind of I, I, I think that did change society beyond recognition because it was through their work that they've been able to kind of, in my view, infiltrate various organizations, having these employer schemes where employers are desperate to kind of gain favor with them. Um, you know, because once these things are embedded in workplace policies, et cetera, and normalizing it, I think that it's very difficult to kind of come back from that. So, yes, I think Stonewall have done a lot of damage. Um, you know, thankfully, their influence is dwindling, but they're still very powerful and can and have a lot of clout. Yeah. And, and somebody like myself, James, who is probably described as a woolly liberal who, you know, uh, affirms an, part of an inclusive church who... Uh, it, well, my position, I want to welcome everybody. You know, I, I, I'm just the kind of person that feels that if you believe something, that's fine. If you believe something else, that's fine. And so when I say inclusive, I don't just mean gay people are uh, welcome through the door. I mean, people on, on on the opposite side who may have a very extreme conservative position. Um, mm. what, what, would, what would you say to somebody that, you know, it's like just live and let live. Do, do, do you think society needs to give people guidance about, about things matters of sexuality or not or, or is that for them on sexuality well, uh, well the whole range you know i mean whether you whether you come out as gay whether you everybody seems to have an opinion don't they certainly in the church yeah. they do anyway um mm. and particularly on this matter of gender dysphoria i think a lot of people and i'll include myself in this i you know i mean i'll probably get some pelters afterwards but uh, for maybe not being educated enough but it but I'm a 55 year old guy that that didn't really have these things to consider and think about, and it's only in more recent times that they become something for me to consider. And I'm really careful I don't say the wrong thing or put or put my foot in it. Uh, I need guidance, I think, and I'm just wondering whether you think that's something that we all need as a society. Well, I think what you've just said is quite interesting um, because historically, I think that the church and also kind of other bodies representing other religions uh, were not so afraid of putting their foot in it because they have their beliefs. And even if those beliefs to some are distasteful or considered a bit, you know, uh, out of touch with the modern era, that's the fundamental basis of the religion. And so they would kind of be proud about saying it. Whereas what I'm hearing more and more is similar to what you said, which is, people coming from a religious perspective walking on eggshells almost to the point that I feel that a lot of the fundamental basics of these religions are essentially being kind of thrown to one side um you know I I it it, it seems increasingly as if the church is kind of propping up this belief that yes you, you you could be trapped in the wrong body and that it's and that it's possible to change sex I, I mean I'm not Christian um I don't believe there's any basis whatsoever to, to kind of put out that statement or something like that. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I, I'm a bit confused as to what's going on in the church. Um, I mean, just yesterday I was driving home and there's a billboard advertising a new church that's opened up. And again, they're, they're, they're calling themselves a kind of inclusive church. And this like, I don't know, priest, vicar with a, like a pride flag around their neck. Um, you know, I, I just, I just don't really know what's going on, but in terms of welcoming your doors to everyone, regardless of view, belief, whatever, yeah, sure. Like, of course we shouldn't be discriminating against people because of their beliefs. I fundamentally believe in freedom of speech, but I find it interesting when religion seem to almost be going along with this agenda to avoid coming in for criticism, even if it flies in the face of some of their kind of fundamental teachings.
Yeah, that's very interesting what you've said. I mean, it, it, it would it would lend itself well, very well to a more conservative theology in the church, you know, and certainly in other faiths, Islam and mm. uh, Judaism, you know, the, these kind of conversations are, would, I would imagine, would be kind of thrown out, you know, the idea of uh, uh, changing sex would just be a complete no-no and is a no, complete no-no for many uh, people that I know within the Church of England. I think maybe uh, I, I'm not. I can't like, speak for the people, but I, I, you know, I didn't go to church for a long time, so I, I came from a world where uh, I grew up in a secular world, working in a <laughs> plug my book, Argos to the altar. I worked for Argos for twenty years. So I worked in the real world, so I, I was party to all sorts of people and experiences. James, just to finish off, can I hmm. can I ask um, how you think we should then perhaps deal with? matters of gender dysphoria what would be your proposal for a way f forward and how we deal with these matters well i think in terms of gender dysphoria i think we need to go back to basics with this and i think we need to come to understand as a society that this is a mental health condition and presentation and so should be dealt with accordingly through explorative therapy or simply or simply through what the term you know watchful waiting that's often been used in relation to children because as i said most children who feel this disconnect will kind of grow out of it essentially um i think we need to put a complete block <laughs> uh, for use of a better word on children taking puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones um and being put on waiting lists for double mastectomies etc um you know uh, for me that's the single most important thing that we have to do here um there's there's, there's so much else in in the world of sex-based rights around women's spaces around women's sports around free speech um but for me we have to look after the children first and foremost because that's kind of really the key job of any society and to make sure children are safe so um, you know, we're waiting for the final review from Dr. Hilary Cass, who's doing a review into the kind of um, gender identity services in the country. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see what she comes out with. There's an NHS ongoing consultation again around treatment for gender dysphoria. I'm hoping that they they, they block all of this, um, but I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen if there's a new government in a few months time. You know, the Labour Party have kind of said... They want to support gender affirming care. They want to support ban on conversion therapy. You know, at one time they were pushing for self ID. Um, so I don't really know. It's could be quite a, an interesting few months. Yeah, I think so, James. I, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I, I think we probably don't hold all the same opinions, but I, I really do. I do really do support the the need for free speech. Uh, you know, and and. Um, I think conversations are the, is the way to get through these things, isn't it? You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I get a few pelters online uh, just for being a priest. And, and so I, I'm sympathetic to the abuse that you, uh, you know, you've described. But, um, yeah, thank, thanks, James. I've really enjoyed your conversation. I'm sure there'll be uh, some reflections from other people once they've watched this. But for now, thank you for coming on the Godcast. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Nice chatting.